audience Q&A, which is actually really fun because we get some time to really probe some of the ideas and, and go deeper um, into the discussion, uh, theoretically and politically. I just wonder, Daniel, if you could elaborate briefly upon your concept of digital dispossession, because I know that's a key concept, one of the articles you recently wrote, and if you could just kind of explain that for the audience and, and tell us how you're thinking through that conceptually and politically. Yeah, so this kind of, it goes back to that uh, slide I showed about mods, but I'm really interested in how if capital is constantly looking for that fix, finding a new place to commodify, right? Like if it's not original accumulation or primitive dispossession, primitive accumulation in, in Marx's explicit terms, it's basically just like finding uncommodified spaces of human life, right? And so finding ways to commodify hobbies, finding ways to commodify um, digital creativity that has not yet been commodified has been a really key uh, thing for capital. I mean, you look at how, you know, so much cultural content, they couldn't find a way to commodify it um, on the early internet. And so what I see with digital dispossession is basically, and I talk about it specifically in terms of games and play and all that kind of stuff, but I really see it as like a jumping off point to think about how on the internet there's lots of creative practices that computers allow to be commodified if platforms can insert themselves and to find a way to like mediate a value relationship that can then be controlled and, and you know you can actually capture money through that and that works with DRM and other kinds of things. So I wrote about that in, uh, specifically with mods that were distributed on a platform called Steam, which is a distribution platform for video games. So it distributed mods on it. And what happened one day was that Steam, which is owned by a corporation called Valve, they said, you know what, congratulations everybody, you wanted to make money making mods, or you were making mods, well now you get to make money from them. So they just snapped one day and turned on a system that said all of that stuff you're giving away for free is now gonna actually be able to have a dollar sign next to it, and you can sell it, so now you can be an entrepreneur. But what happened is that all these people that were just doing something because they wanted to be a part of a community, they all hated it. They were like, you're ruining my life, now I have to think about uh, you know, like contracts and intellectual property, and and this is muddied up too because they were only allowed to create these things with the IP and the technology of these game companies, um, because the game companies let them do it without making money. So it's kind of complicated, but really it's all about just like taking what hasn't been commodified and then commodifying it in digital spaces using digital technologies. Great, thank you. Okay, so why don't we turn to the audience now? And Toronto, we have been in contact with the, um, the CMG, the Canadian Media Guild, oh, yeah. which is associated with the Communication Workers of America, right? So that is the CM, uh, this, um, CMA. So um, that's been here. And every city, it's kind of different, right? So in the UK, the IWGB, which is like that kind of like, you know, really like class struggle oriented, small organizing, unorganized union. Um, yeah, I, I think every city is kind of approaching it differently. So it'll depend on basically whatever uh, organizers in those places are doing that. But even then, just recently, uh, the AFL-CIO um, said, hey, we want to organize game workers. Like they literally had the treasurer or something like that go on the internet and write a story for Kotaku, which is a big video game outlet, um, and say, hey, we're interested. So there is interest even from big uh, industrial unions to like to do that kind of work. I, it's such early days that yeah, I have I, I don't know enough about the specifics of like labor law in every different country to like speak to it. But I mean, um, I know that's one thing right now. I really want to like think about is like how, like right now it feels like Game Workers United is really this kind of like broad grassroots. Like it's almost like a workers center, right? It's really just saying like, hey, like come here, regardless of where you work, like come to us and then we can provide resources and you know, materials and like support and connections and other kinds of things to get you involved with labor organizing. Um, but it's definitely not like, I'm sure in some cities it's probably more advanced where hopefully, like my guess is that like, yeah, they're doing a specific campaign at a specific uh, studio, but you really do need to get those like, those first few people that are interested, get them to do some training, you know, to know what it's, you know, like don't talk about this, you know, when your managers can hear you, like all that kind of stuff, right? Like. All the basics, it's not even there yet, really, right? Like, so there's so much, I feel like, scaffolding that needs to be done, ideological. So, I mean, like, and that's, like, the thing. Everyone that's involved, people involved with this organization, I think, come in. I mean, and we can say, like, there's been, like, rising class consciousness across 
lots of sectors of North American society, we talk about things in a way now that we didn't talk about five years ago, right? Like, so a lot of these people definitely are that they're committed to that. Like they, they're like, okay, I understand there's a class struggle here and I want to get involved and, and I work in games, so I'm interested in organizing in games. Like I think the people I know have that, that sense, right? Um, yeah, so like, but when it comes to like actually organizing an individual company, it'll also depend on like who is actually, is, are any of those ideologically committed people at a company where it's like they're there for years? Like, you know, you can go to Ubisoft here in Toronto. Like, those are pretty stable jobs. They don't have s serious layoffs. Like, so if we, you know, like, if theoretically, if like if you're talking to people there, you'd want to really be, um, you know, like, you'd be hoping that they would be doing, you'd, I mean, they would have to be doing that kind of work at work, right? And the nice thing is they all do work at the same place, right? So the fragmentation of like the problems with like organizing gig workers, for instance, isn't the case with large companies like this. So, um, but yeah, I, I think really it does come down to it. There is a lot of ideological work that needs to be done <laughs> to, to scaffold that. Because you got to get people committed to do that actual labor, which is time intensive. It's dangerous to your job. Um, yeah, so. It, it really comes down to, again, like the ideological commitment of those people that are actually organizing their individual union, mm -hmm. right? Because like at a work site, you'd be like, it's only going to be as good as you. Like the energy that you put in is what you'll get out. And you have to convince people at that to, to those who will become important movers and shakers in that organizing process, they have to be dedicated to that struggle, right? Like, because um, yeah, there's no guarantee that a union suddenly, you know, wakes up and realizes that gender oppression is a thing or racial, you know, disparities and stuff like that. Because like all these companies also, like they're all dedicated to the kind of uh, liberal um, conception of like diversity in companies, right? They're like, oh, like, you know, we. We really want to push diversity, diversity here, diversity this, diversity that. Um, and what a lot of the people that are involved in pushing back for unionization, they say like, yeah, but you're just, these are just, this is an HR version of diversity. It's not actually one that actually is standing up for us. So I think it is really up to those people. And again, like the people involved in this organization that started it were like, um, like I'd say like two or three of the most important people are all trans women. So it's like, it is very much led and, and spearheaded by, you know, oppressed people that are like, don't just see this in terms of like, just crass kind of like class issues, but like, in sense of like a broader conception of what a struggle against oppression is, that is rooted in, you know, like a, the class analysis of um, like fighting for a labor organization. But I don't, yeah, like, I would say that's a huge issue is just like, this organization as like a broader group really does need to make sure that the eye is always on it can't just be a reductive, right? It can't just be focused on only one issue above other. Like, I guess in the sense of like, it needs to make sure that it's being very attentive to those issues of equity. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's, I, like, if anything, I would say I'm, I'm more of an orthodox Marxist than what maybe that suggests up there. Like, I, yeah, I don't think, I'm, I'm not like, I, you know, I, if you read that digital spatial fix paper, it's all about just like, me being kind of salty with heart and agree. Um, so, you know, we're, I definitely, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's like a quantitative ratcheting up of existing trends in the broader economy, but I don't think it's like a qualitative change. Like this is a mode of production, like, you know, this kind of like manipulating symbols and creative, you know, all this kind of stuff. Like it's being fragmented as we speak. Like Harry Braverman is really important to me as just like a workplace theorist and stuff. And like machine learning, uh, the platforms that they use at these companies and all this kind of stuff, it's all about fragmenting and descaling work at these companies. And it's not going to stay high paid for long. And that's what a lot of people are kind of coming to realize now is that workplace tasks and stuff like that are, they are trying to find new ways to like basically make it so their workers are, don't have as much leverage. I haven't seen, again, it's such early days and like, I, I only see, like, just from, and the thing is, is like, my, my like, in the case, like, my, my praxis here is, like, it's not, like, my research area. Like, my research area is much more on the kind of, like, app stores and, you know, kind of high-level uh, theoretical questions with, like, mm -hmm. democracy and stuff like that. Well, like, yeah, I mean, what I'm seeing, like, what I see as far as, like, the actual organizing itself on the ground, it's such early days. Like, we're not even at the place where, like, they need to hire the mobsters yet because <laughs> there's no... <laughs> It's like, it's so, like, there's not even gotten to the point where I think 
I don't think management of these companies has even had to think about unionizing and union and, and labor activism in general ever to the point where like I think they might be kind of bowled over at first and then they're probably going to talk to their friends at the, at the Chamber of Commerce and figure out actually there's things you can do to get ahead of these people and so that's a thing where again like the people involved in these organizations really do need to really build on the experience of those who've come before them both historically in the sense of like those industries, so like, I know we've had contact with IATSE here in, in Toronto, um, but yeah, broadly, like there's a lot of uh, organizations that definitely like could help with that memory that will help us be ahead of that. You would find it um, completely unsurprising that it is almost impossible to do research at video game companies. Um, they are extremely secretive. They are obsessed with their intellectual property, and they are obsessed with the se not letting any message leave the, the company that isn't properly framed by their, by their marketing team, right? So, like, being able to get into a studio and actually see what the work conditions are like, or, like, there's very few of us that have done that. And there's a few good studies about it. Those, there are people that have gotten in. Um, but I can't actually think of any that have been, there's definitely haven't been any that are like, here's the, like, you know, uh, the Harry Braverman style, like here is how workplace, like this is how managers are dominating workers in very specific ways that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. It is definitely, it's one of those, it's again, it's the kind of culture of an industry where it's like, you don't leave, no, your boss is like, you can go home whenever you want. No big deal, we're, we're like an easy, cool going, you know, like we got, like we got ping pong tables and beer whenever you want it, no big deal. You know, like we're all family, right? And then, so you can go home whenever you want, but then it's like, if everyone else on the team hasn't gone home, you feel weird when you go home, right? And then they say, well, we really need that done. You know, like, we're not gonna tell you to stay, but you wanna work hard, right? Like, you care about the job, you know? So it is those, like, it really will take a coordinated effort of people at a, at a company to say, like, not only am I not gonna, I'm gonna take my punch card and leave when it says I'm going to, but me and my whole unit are gonna do that at the same time, right? And all of us together will do that. So that will take really kind of like classic workplace organizing. That right? sounds well, I would say, it, yeah, it depends on the person. I mean, the, the, ones, the ones I know who are, who are Marxist, <laughs> they're like, I'm a, I'm a worker. Like, those, those are the ones that like they've, you know, and this is like they've come to Marxism, you know, often through internet and friends and, and, you know, politics and all this kind of stuff. And those are the ones who I think kind of form the core element of the international organization. Um, obviously not all of them necessarily, but I think, yeah, like some developers definitely like, they're like, I'm a game developer. Like that is me. Like, so, and there's also another key part of this is that app stores and PCs and things like that, like also mean that like, there is a, I think less and less people think this, but for a long time there was the issue of like, well, you, you do your time at a big company, but then you know what, at home you're working on your indie game, and if you're lucky, you release your indie game on one of these stores, and you make it big, and you print, you know, you make a couple million bucks, because uh, you, you, you made it big. And that was a thing that was really popular as an idea back in 9, 2010-ish, like really was the idea of like, you could, so there's that small business entrepreneurial conception of the work that definitely plays a really important role on, on I think the class consciousness of the industry that is something I think it's fading now because more and more people realize you are very unlikely to, to make it big. Like it's a fluke of, of history to basically m make millions of dollars or more um, as like an indie developer. But for a long time, that was a really big thing. The books in the 70s, the Tofflers, the Bells, when they're basically saying that the new post-Fordist sort of post-industrial economy marks a rupture or a break from all the stuff that Marxists and socialists used to complain about for the you know, 20th century. It's all new, we need to completely rethink capitalism, rethink relations between workers and managers. And, and that became very popular, especially within American academia, the social science and humanities. And it's only over the past sort of you know, 10, 15 years that we're trying to grapple with the actual existing class relations yeah. in sectors that weren't supposed to sort of um, reflect those in a way. Like it was a holistic process, you know, idea, to coding, to art, the whole thing was like, you know, a couple folks, right? Now, you go to a major game production studio, you will see rows and rows of fragmented tasks, teams organized in very specific ways. And even if there's a little bit of organic movement within a team around sharing about abilities and things, like it's still routinely 
like it is stratified and it has been, if not tailorized, it has been fragmented and, right. and controlled, right? And so it's like that is, the, the, these are the people that realize like what's happening, like uh, machine learning will come for their job. It will try to find a way to, to make this, um, you know, cheaper and cheaper. That's what's, yeah, so. Companies like Facebook and Google are basically privatizing what used to be public policy, limiting the space for even citizens in a liberal democratic sense to intervene to shape that terrain, let alone workers and socialists right now. Um, so like, you know, if you go to Twitter, if you go to Facebook, you go to Google, they have like privatized user policy. It's like user agreements, you know, in the place of what used to be like national law regulation and policy. Um, and they're starting to emerge in a, across Europe and elsewhere. This is a train of struggle. But the companies are so far ahead of what's even going on uh, in sort of social movement activism, let alone unions, let alone even sort of left socialist activism as well. So that's something I think is really serious for the 21st century. Just thinking through what would the democratization of the internet, of the web of social media look like? Um, and, and how I just actually accept how far we're, we're away from that. Yeah. I would also like these companies to get taxed more as well. Um, you know, a big part of my current research, I have a paper coming out in the Canadian Journal of Communication really soon that does talk about Canadian cultural policy and how right now the biggest problem with employment relations, like the industrial relationship of these companies with Canada is that we basically give them massive, immense amounts of tax breaks. So when we saw Toronto set up here, they were given like $238 million in a grant by the Ontario government. And people went to Dalton McGinty, and they're like, does this mean Toronto, Ontario has a stake in the company? And they're like, oh, no, no, of course not. That would be a government having a stake in a company. That's like, that's ridiculous. You know, so like, I, I agree. And I'm like, no, no, if we give money to these companies, we should own part of them. The funny thing is, though, uh, the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund, or the, yeah, does own a part of Ubisoft because they helped stop a, a, a hostile takeover of Ubisoft by another French multinational called Vivendi. So the pension fund of Ontario uh, teachers is now a sizable investor, along with Tencent, who does not have voting chairs, uh, of Ubisoft. So it is very, um, but yeah, like I, I think tax breaks are like, they don't need them. And it's labor costs. They get in uh, Quebec in the neighborhood of 35% of all labor is, is paid off by the provincial government. So our industry is really dependent on neoliberal modes of development which line the pockets of the rich and you know sure jobs get created but that value is captured by shareholders in France you know or now the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund which is kind of funny. Yeah, I, think that, so, I think the proposal to tax more is again quite radical given that the game of the neoliberal state in the age of global capital is to incentivize foreign capital to mobilize within certain territorial local districts you know, the name of competitiveness or sort of some creative industry development strategy. Back to the point about popular culture as a train of political struggle for the left to take seriously. In digital games, the content or the simulated realities of games, that, at least that afford their user, a train of struggle. Are we seeing the emergence of potentially anti-capitalist video games, at least a level of storytelling, themes, ideology? If we were to get into a big debate about the ideology of the games industry, not from the point of view of production, but the point of view of text vis-a-vis -vis player, what, what sort of are we seeing happening in the sector? I mean, could, is, it, is it liberal? Is it conservative? Is it a mix of both? Have any games been released over the past decade or so that could actually uh, address the uh, emerging anxieties around capitalism, class, ecological degradation, what's to be done in response to it? You know, so, so I'm just thinking, and this is a question for the audience as much as it is for you. So can games help us in our, in our ability to imagine uh, another world? Lead a workers' rebellion against the evil corporate. Yeah. It's like, it's like a total recall, yeah. Yeah. right? It's like you, you got to fight against the evil corporation. There's lots of, there's lots of mo video games about fighting evil corporations um, as some kind of like militant insurgent. Although they're never th making that jump to like, Anything kind of critical of maybe liberalism as an idea, though, doesn't happen too often. Yeah. But yeah. gamers naturally gravitate towards right-wing politics. I actually, I think that's far from the truth. I think some of them are, and they make a very loud voice, and they use communication technologies to definitely do that. But let me also say that, yeah, like some of the most radical people I know, I know through my gaming Marxist, you know, Facebook group, right? Like that's how I'm involved in this group in the first place. That's how I saw it get born. 
right? Because people who played games were themselves like, they're like, yeah, like I, they've grown up, they've had many different political awakenings, and this is, you know, coming to the left, and, and, and like, you know, Marxism or, or socialism, communism, whatever it might be, they, they are on board with that. And games have been a fundamental part of that identity for them. Um, as far as like games beyond this, it, you know, it's like all things, like I think the majority of games still fall into the ideological traps of, of liberalism or conservatism is kind of a thing, like even nominally critical games like uh, made by Rockstar, like Red Dead Redemption 2, which basically does implicate American capitalism with genocide and a lot of other things. It still capitulates in the end. It's kind of like, but it's the only way things are. Everything's kind of messed up. It's Obama politics. Yeah, it's, like, it's still, it's like there's bad things happening, but you know, like, well, what can we do? I mean, it's interesting that those things do shine through anyway, right? It's important that it shines through. Um, and there are lots of people making small games. Uh, if you, you know, go on a website called um, itch.io, for instance, you can find tons of small personal art games that people make. Um, there's tons of games, uh, you know, that have been made f with explicitly Marxist purposes, you know, talking about the labor theory of value or, you know, how gentrification works. I have a friend right now making a, a top-down RPG that's all about Organ, like organizing a union um, at a potion factory. It's like a, you know, <laughs> right? Like it's like, you know, there are people that are using this medium to communicate and, you know, I would go to, back to Walter Benjamin, right? Like, you know, you can, like new art and the, the manipulation of images and stuff means that anyone can use it to tell any story they want, right? You just kind of do that. Great. Well, I think that we're going to wrap up there. I want to uh, thank all of you for coming tonight and participating. That was a really rich discussion. Thanks so much to Dan. For